Okay, IP portfolio development, and is your is your IP house in order? So I'm Greg Grissett. I'm with the Alfred uh, Kerman Law Firm. I chair the IP practice at the firm. Um, my expertise is in medical devices. It comprises about 70 to 80 percent of my practice. Um, a lot of it is patent counseling, patent strategy, just helping companies navigate patent issues in a lot of different contexts. We're going to talk about two of those contexts today. So part one, just to give everybody an overview of IP and a little bit of a deep dive into patents and, and what they are and what they protect specifically. Part two, uh, is your revenue model protected by your patent strategy? And this may be, maybe it's not a question you would think about from a patent standpoint, but it's one I like to ask clients. Um, part three, what is your risk position with respect to competitor patents? So what are we really talking about? We're talking about protecting our, our revenue model, but also mitigating and minimizing risk. And businesses want to know this, certainly investors want to know this. Um, two important issues that, that you wrestle with as we go through this. So part one, overview of IP. IP classically is, is really four different rights. You got trademarks, this is a, a source of goods or services. This is really your brands, okay? It's your brand protection. It's a word, a logo, or what have you. Copyrights, I put here creative works, but the, the legal definition is, is uh, a work of authorship fixed in a tangible medium of expression. That sounds very fancy, but it's art, songs, words, software, software code, user interfaces, your websites, any, your marketing materials, the things that you express uh, to the world, uh, either in, in, in software form or, or, or other, other mechanisms. Trade secrets, valuable secrets. The, their value is der derived by them not being generally known and you actually taking steps to keep them secret. That's an important piece. This is generally the definition that holds across the country, but more or less, you've, it's got to be value because it's not known, and you want to protect it. If you distribute information you know, publicly through social media outlets, you're not maintaining that as a secret. Okay. If you have a manufacturing plant and you're not limiting access to important parts or not requiring a non-disclosure agreement before your visitors see your manufacturing plant, that's not taking reasonable steps to protect a secret. Okay. So trade secrets, patents, I put products, processes, devices. This is really you know, protecting structure and function of, of what inventors are, are developing. Uh, it could be, of course, pharma products, compositions, medical devices. Uh, it ranges to the diagnostic space, to, to implants and, and what have you. 20 years from filing is how long patents last. So let's dig a little bit more into, into patents. Really important concept to understand for patents. They're exclusionary rights, all right? When you get a granted US patent, it gives the owner the right to prevent others from doing all these things in the United States, important here, as claimed in the patent, all right? So an exclusionary right. I like to use the, the, the one acre example. Let's say I have one acre in Chester County, Pennsylvania, which is where I came from. Um, I have the right to charge you for coming onto my one acre, all right? Same thing, what a patent does. What a patent doesn't give me is the right to maybe go on Joe Haig's one acre in San Diego, all right? So owning a patent doesn't necessarily give you the right to infringe other people's patents. Important distinction, we'll explore that a little bit more in a bit. And again, important here, the right of the patent is given in exchange for information. Who here has, has had the pleasure of reading patents and patent documents? Okay. So they're long, they're dense, some of them could be, some of them could be vaguely written, but that part of that, that, that the disclosure is, is the result of, of, of having to tell the world about your invention, how to make it, how to use it, uh, and how it might work in a certain setting. The most important thing you've ever read in a patent are you know, the claims at the end, okay? It's the numbered sentences, this is an example of one at the end of the patent. The name of the game is the claim. If there's anything else you, you, you read, please read the claims at the end of the patents. That is where the rights are. That defines the scope of the rights. Uh, important here is valid claims. It's an important concept. Valid claims are novel and non-obvious over the prior art. Joe mentioned a, you know, a good point. What is prior art? Okay, really, it means everything that has come before the time that you filed for your patent. Typically publications, prior U.S. patents, U.S. patent applications, journal articles, uh, articles that perhaps professors, you know, write and publish. That's all prior art. Could it be disseminating your product on a Kickstarter campaign? Well, yeah. One type of prior art is prior sales. So if you sell your invention before you file for a patent, you're foregoing those patent rights. Not such an issue in the medical device concept, context when you have an implantable because you have to go through some market approval, but it's important to know. You can offer your product for sale and that will start a time, a time period. But the, the key thing here in a patent 
is the claim. They define the scope of the rights. This will be important later. So in, in the medical device con context, and, and, and my position and, and outlook is, your patents should cover, and what I mean there, and when you hear something or somebody say patents cover, what they really mean is claim different aspects of the value chain in, in, in your particular setting. Um, the other thing that we should think about as we go through this talk is medical device companies, they should utilize the US patent system to address competitive threats. I put here continuation applications because it's one area that I see other companies sort of miss the boat sometimes and some companies do it right. We'll talk about continuation applications a bit more. All right, is your revenue model protected? Okay, why, why am I asking about your revenue model? Well, inventors invent things. They invent technology uh, and they may develop a new market. We, talk, we learned today that there are sometimes you have a problem that you solve and you have to create a market around it, all right? The, the business that you're developing there isn't direct tied totally to technology. It's tied to you being able to invoice a company for something and then to pay you on that invoice. So when I'm speaking of are we, are we protecting our revenue model, your patent strategy should account for what you're going to generate in terms of, of revenue in exchange for what you're invoicing your customers for. An important concept that we'll dig into more. So this is a just a, a, a generalized version of a, of a value chain you may have Vendors, assembly, I, I put a product designer, our, our medical device company here, let's just call it Medco, surgical use. This is more in the implantable space. But the value chain, you can apply the principles to, to other, other contexts. Let's say in this situation, patents are owned and cover the product here as it's delivered to the hospital system or to the physician. This is a pretty classic you know, scenario. This is at a minimum what a company should be doing in the medical device system. In this example, what you're shipping to the hospital, you're gonna send an invoice for, and what you're gonna get money for, you know, is, is that which we're claiming. And the red box in this and the subsequent slides, these are my claims, okay? We wanna cover this particular area. Now, can your customer buy it from a third party? Well, practically not without permission from, from Medco. Now, are there other, other factors in play in, in the business setting? Of course, uh, but this is just one, one part of it. Let's change the value chain a little bit. We've talked earlier today about some ancillary services. Let's say med medical uh, device company says, you know what, I want a little bit more robust protection. Let's extend our patent coverage into methods, surgical methods, or use of the implant, or use of the product. And also, maybe there's an app or a software as a service that we're offering to the hospital system as an adjunct to the implant and the instruments that we want to sell, okay? You may not be getting revenue for this, but it may help close the deal. Now, what if you had patent protection for that ancillary service, as well as surgical use? Now remember, we're having claims that, that of course, still have to be new and non-obvious over the prior art, but now you're in a position where you're covering different parts of your value chain in, in a bit more robust way. Is, is this gonna cause money to fall from the sky by itself? No, but, Will it change how a hospital system or your competitors approach the market? I think so, uh, it typically does. You know, this is a message really to the competitors that, you know what, to really match the value proposition, I've got to then design around this ancillary service patent, I've got to design around a surgical use patent, I've got to design around a product that the designer had created. That's a pretty significant uh, task to do and task to accomplish. You're just making your life difficult for competitors. Okay. Now, let's go one step further and let's go down the backwards into the supply chain. Maybe we can cover uh, some method of assembly in putting the patent together. All right. Maybe we can even go further and down to component vendors. Now, in this situation, uh, three to five years down the road where you're offering you're generating your revenue, you're, you're engaging with hospital systems and physicians or, or what have you, but you're also protecting you know, your supply chain. So just think about what type of negotiating position your company may have in this environment. Is it, will it be the be all end all? No, you still have to have good products, you still have to have good clinical outcome, you still have to execute, you still have to have good distribution plans, but is there anybody in the room that wouldn't like to have a little bit more leverage when you go to the negotiating table with customers or suppliers, okay? Having uh, source protection this far back in the supply chain can give you some comfort. It would make your supply chain professionals probably, you know, a little bit, rest a little bit more easy at night. 
And again, can customer buy from a third party, not without permission from Medco? The other thing I would ask here, um, you know, could your component vendor sell their product to a third party if you cover their technology? Well, not really without permission. So in this context, you can see how patents can be used a little bit further back in the supply chain just to help with your business. Okay, switching gears to continuations. What can, how can we use the patent system to address competitive threats and just the dynamics of the marketplace? You introduce a product, somebody is going to copy you or copy the essentials of what you're doing or, or copy a competing product. How do we address that? Well, in the US, thankfully, you can file, say, this first application. And before it actually matures into a US patent, you can file what we call a continuation. And I said here, filed January 1, 2018. Two years later, while this is still pending, you can file another continuation. This strategy can be used for as long as there is patent term available. Uh, okay, it, large medical advice companies do it. I think smart companies that have the resources and, and the ability to invest in IP in, in, a, in a robust way do this. And we'll get to, we'll go through some examples of, of why this is important, but just continuations. All right. You file patent application A, January 1, 2015. The application issues as a patent, January 2, 2018. Your, you, your patent covers your product. Great. Maybe you even have some patents back in the supply chain or use patents. But you elect not to file a continuation to save money. And we're talking four to $6,000 to file a continuation application. All right. Two years later, which this will happen, introduces a competing product that copies almost all of your essential features. Not quite everything, but just enough to get a similar clinical outcome at a price that's competitive. All right. The competing product somehow avoids the patent claims. Well, there's two conversations you got to have. One is, what do we do, and then how do we miss it? Sometimes you can't anticipate what your competitors will do and how they modify or change a product. Sometimes technology changes and shifts the, the, the underlying groundwork that you've been working with. Well, in this case, from a patent standpoint, I, I can't really do much to, to help. I don't have... I, I, Okay, you got a, got patents that, that don't cover anything. Let's fast forward a bit. Same scenario, you file continuations, you've got a patent that covers your product, but now you've got some continuation spending, competitor comes, copies the essential features of what is issued, what do you do? Well, now my client can come to me and say, look, we've got a competitor that's entered the market, what can we do? I go check, I look at their continuation, I draft patent claims, now that competitor has patent infringement risk that they didn't have before, all right? So continuations are tools. They're biz there's business tools to use to help you protect what you're investing in. Okay, I wanna just speed up a bit. Pr protect as much as the value chain as you can and make use of continuations to react to the market. That's what you need to learn or know from part one. Part two, avoiding IP infringement. This is about risk mitigation and reducing the expense of dealing with patent infringement risk, or patent infringement. Often I get a question like this, you're, you've, you develop a product, you're close to market, you haven't done a patent search, you don't know what's out there, you know, what do you do? We're talking about freedom to operate studies here, when, how they, what they are and, and when you should do them. Importantly, this is a search and analysis of patents to determine the risk of patent infringement for marketing a product or service in the U.S. Important here that FTO and patent infringement is about the commercial product. It has nothing to do, in essence, with your own patents. It's all about what you're selling in the U.S. Okay, why do you do this? Well, you want to know if you infringe a third party's patent. Some of this is just practical information. Uh, that's the business reason you would do an FBO. There's a legal reason. If you get sued for patent infringement and, you get, and you're found to infringe and you can't prove the patents are invalid, the judge can say, you know what? You willfully infringe that patent. We're going to triple damages. Well, your freedom to operate opinion can be introduced as evidence to minimize that by a third. So that's the legal reason we would have a freedom to operate opinion. That is reducing, that's reducing damages award. That could be significant. And again, investors want freedom to operate. Investors don't want to buy a lawsuit. Freedom to operate gives you an idea of how to assess that. Okay, this chart is available. I won't go through it, but the idea here is you only, you, you only have risk of patent infringement when you infringe a patent that is actually valid. So the freedom to operate study is about investigating those two things, infringement and validity separately, okay? Now, just real quick, uh, phase one of the FTO, let's say the patent claim has a device comprising a brown widget, a gray gizmo, an actuator, and a controller. You come to me with product A, it has a brown widget, a gray gizmo, a first actuator, and you're like, look, we added a second actuator. I don't infringe a patent and a controller. Well, actually you do. Product A infringes claim one because 
Product A has everything that claim one requires. Important, I'm talking about product A. I'm not looking at your patent applications that cover product A. I'm looking at what you're gonna make and sell, okay? Well, let's think about what we could do to change it. We're doing a design around analysis here. What can we change? The engineers come back and says, you know what? Our gizmo doesn't need to be gray, it can be black. So you change it. Right now, product B doesn't infringe. I don't have literal patent infringement there, and I've avoided that patent risk. You wouldn't know that if you hadn't done the FDA study. You wouldn't know that unless you had your counsel look at this issue in some detail, all right? Incidentally, maybe this black gizmo is patentable in and of itself. So you've done a design around of a competitor's patents, and you've identified subject matter that can increase your patent asset, okay? Maybe it's not, maybe a great changing from gray to black is not that special, but it's worth at least looking at it. The other thing to uh, keep in mind here is that this design around that you may patent and if you do get a patent for it, is also preventing, preventing third parties from adopting that design around, okay? So you are staking out claims to the design arounds that you're doing when you're avoiding patents. Okay, patent litigation, just a, a big summary. Why FDOs are important is really at this, the bottom here. $25 million at stake, patent infringement through trial costs you $2.5 million. That's both sides. That's a lot to, to stomach when you're a plaintiff and you want to go after somebody. But you also have to know the defendant has the same pressure that you will, okay? And this is the tool that you can use. Here's some recent statistics from 2017. I'll, I'll skip through this. I do want to get through timing. When do you do an FDO study? This is a hard question. I'll, I'll be honest. It should be after something that's very basic and conceptual but it should be before you're about to order millions of dollars worth of components to assemble products, or you have a large capital outlay, all right? or somewhere near you're submitting your products for clinical trial, because you wanna know. If I get a product approved that still infringes a patent, that doesn't necessarily help your risk position. You know, so you wanna do that sometime you know, ahead. Usually, I'll tell people, if you don't have solid models and you don't have a bill of material, a real bill of material, then a freedom to operate is a little premature. You need to be that sort of technical, that commercially detailed, because you want to have some sense that this is what you're going to make and sell. Um, the other part is when you make substantial product changes, what do substantial product changes mean? It, it could be different for different companies, but if there's a significant product change, your risk position could change, and you want to assess that. The important thing is, is to build this into your pipeline, build this into the way that you're innovating your products so that you're addressing these points from time to time. Okay. Really, this is the last slide, but patentability, I say, obtaining patents. This is about protecting your revenue model. In part one, um, it's an assessment of the prior art and the publications. Importantly, freedom to operate is about av avoiding patents. Focus solely on what you will sell and receive money for. Okay. And with that, I'll open it up. I know that last questions. slide is really important, so if you want to leave that up yep. while we're talking. Um, what do you do if somebody just doesn't play by the rules? You play, put a patent, but you know, perhaps just because they're so easily maligned, China sees it and they knock off. And what's your real recourse here? Well, you've got you've got to have the tools in place to to have recourse. Number one, if you don't have patent protection, even if you're worried about uh, actors in, in China, typically they still have to import into the U.S. And under U.S. patent law, if you can prove infringement, you can stop goods at a port. That is pretty significant. No business manager, whether they're in China or in the U.S., wants to deal with their goods being held up at Long Beach. Okay, it's just a, that's still an option and still available. Yes, uh, really great talk. Thanks for that. Uh, I just had a question about patenting up the food chain, so components and assembly methods and that sort of thing. Yeah, uh, I definitely agree with it. But how practically enforceable are those patents? You know, I can see your finished medical device or your molecule, but I can't necessarily see how you got there. Yeah, you know, unless I happen to be in your factory. Yeah, so there's some, some generalizations here, but I, I'll give you, you know, maybe an, an example. If I have a spinal implant that's made of three special polymeric blends, and you blend them together and, and you put them together in an interesting way. Well, I have probably patent protection for the implant, regardless of what it's made for, regardless of what it's made of. But maybe I can still seek patent protection for these specific polymer blends, okay, as a composition. Now, how do you detect in, in enforcement? That, that's a challenge for, for every industry. You know, often we, we get information that trickles up from the salespeople and the sales group, and just generally information that comes around. If you get your hands on a sample, we can test it. 
Part of my job is when we're drafting these patent claims is to make sure that we can assess a device. If, if I have an implant right here, or I have a, a, a sample of a polymer blend, that we can send it to a lab, and that report will validate that it infringes the claim. So some of that is just being crafty uh, and, and thoughtful when you're drafting your patents. Greg, I want to thank you again for being a sponsor because, as I've shared, there are some folks here in the audience who otherwise might not have been here had it not been for your support. So thank you very much. Right Greg Grissett. Thank you. Thank you.